Can you hear me? Is it on? Greetings, everyone. Thanks so much for being here at Eastern Oregon University this sunny afternoon. Um, I'm Nick Neely, an assistant professor of English writing here at EOU. And um, I'm a faculty in our low residency MFA program as, as, as well. I also teach undergraduates, some of which are in the audience here, which I'm thankful for. Um, welcome to this EOU Ars Poetica reading and conversation, conversation featuring essayist Allison Cobb and her Oregon Book Award winning uh, collection, or maybe I should just call it a book, um, Plastic, an Autobiography. She'll be reading for us, and then we'll be in conversation for a bit before we in warmly invite your, your questions. Uh, as we set up, I also wanted to begin with a brief land acknowledgement, um, which is something I found myself thinking about while reading Allison's book in terms of what makes uh, the components of apology and the extent to which land acknowledgement is a, is a useful apology or is one. Um, and maybe we'll get into that in our, in our conversation. Um, but it's a place to start, at least. And many of us are here in La Grande, those in the audience, and those of you online might be here too. So I would like to say uh, we humbly acknowledge the original inhabitants of the land Eastern Oregon University is upon, the Cayuse, Umatilla, Walla Walla, and Nez Perce people. We celebrate their traditions, languages, and stories. We acknowledge their continuing connection to this land, water, and community and pay our respects to these original stewards of Northeastern Oregon. Thank you. I, I wanted to thank a few other individuals who've had a hand in this event. Um, first, theater professor Heather Tomlinson, who is the force behind Arts Fest and a, a great colleague here in the arts. And um, thanks also to the support of the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social, Social Sciences and the wider university uh, for their help in this day and this event. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Susan Moore, representing the nonprofit Literary Arts, um, Oregon's standout champion of literary writing and the, and the sponsor of the Oregon Book Awards and tonight's event. Um, thanks so much to you and Literary Arts, Susan. Hi, everyone. Thank you all for being here. Um, and thanks especially to Nick and um, Eastern Oregon University for hosting us tonight. Um, it's really great to be here with Allison Cobb, who is the um, Oregon Book Award winner uh, from 2022 for her book, Plastic and Autobiography, which I know Nick is going to talk more about in a little bit. Um, yeah, and the Oregon Book Awards is a program of literary arts, and we are a community-based nonprofit with a 35-year history of serving readers and writers, and our mission is to engage readers, support writers, and inspire the next generation with great literature. And you can hear um, our, our, our radio show, The Archive Project, is, is broadcast statewide um, on OPB, and you can hear some of the Portland Arts and Lectures talks are replayed on that. We also have a Writers in the Schools program, and of course, the Oregon Book Awards and Fellowships. We also um, host the Portland Book Festival, uh, which is in November. And if there are writers in the audience, you don't have to raise your hand, but I did want to let you know that we just opened applications for the Oregon Literary Fellowships. There's no charge to apply, and um, that's money for writers. And you don't have to be a published writer to um, be awarded a fellowship. I brought some copies of the guidelines here, and I'm happy to talk with any of you if you have any questions about that. Uh, so the Oregon Book Awards are presented every year for some of the finest writing by Oregon's authors. Out-of-state judges are asked to choose up to five finalists, including the winner in each category. And Allison Cobb is the 2022 winner of the Sarah Winnemucca Award in Creative Nonfiction for Plastic and Autobiography. And I think I'm going to turn it over to Nick here. He has a lot to say, and I know that we want to hear from Allison too. So thank you so much for being here. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Thank you, Susan. And um, I should really just adjust this. But I'm not. Thanks for bringing me here. Um, thanks so much, Susan. Thanks to Literary Arts. Um, I, I've, I'm going to introduce Plastic only briefly. Um, but I just wanted to note that in addition to 
Um, the fire or the Oregon Book Award, uh, Plastic won the Firecracker Award in Creative Nonfiction from the Council of Literary Magazines and Presses, a prestigious indie award. And um, as the publisher, Night, Night Boat Books describes plastic, quote, Cobb's obsession with a large plastic car part, which turns out to be a fender, I'll add, leads her to explore the violence of our consume and dispose culture, including her own life as a child of Los Alamos, where the first atomic bombs were made. The journey exposes the interconnections among plastic wastes, climate change, nuclear technologies, and racism. In the judge's citation for the Oregon Book Award, the critic John Freeman says, why have we created a culture of such one waste if we want to live on Earth? In the long shelf of books in interrogating our moment in the climate crisis, this memoir is a sharp, urgent breakthrough, a triumph of honesty. Also uh, a poet, Cobb is the author of three previous books and is a senior director of equity and justice at the Environmental Defense Fund. She lives in, in Portland. To say just a little bit more about Allison's book and also to speak to some of the plastic around us that you see, yesterday afternoon, my wife and I put up this plastic insulation. It represents about a year's worth of plastic consumption, uh, largely of our family. And I began to store it outside in our woodshed where it got a little dusty over, times, over time and sometimes filled with water. Perhaps because of that dust yesterday as we were building it, receptacles would reliably fall off and they may fall off while, while we're here together. And if, if you hear that, just bear with us. Uh, falling with a thud, clang like an apple in, uh, to the ground and fall, or perhaps more aptly like a suddenly calving glacier. The exer exercise of, of putting this up drove home so much, just how much we consume, how unimaginative we are in our purchasing, uh, the relative privilege of our purchasing power to buy things like coconut cream cheese and organic juice as we do harm to the environment and to others more vulnerable to pollution. As we worked on it, it became a literal web in front of the windows and it also brought me into a web of thinking and association, and of course I was thinking all along of Allison's searing, searing web-like book um, of some of the terrifying facts in it, like 40% of plastic goes into single-use packaging, and that people eat and breathe, quote, on average the weight of a credit card in plastic, excuse me, on average the weight of a credit card goes into people's bodies each week, something I ha will probably Think about every time I pull out a credit card from my wallet. But the exercise of hanging this plastic also nudged me just a little further toward one of the key ethics and, and great lines in Allison's book that, quote, by remembering across generations and without refusal our pained entanglements and by being responsible, answerable to that pain, we can carry each other into a past that might make a living future. Thanks so much, Allison, for making the long drive out here and being with us this evening to share your brilliant and very entangling book. Hi, how's that? Can you hear me back there in the back row? I saw a little smile, so I'm going to thumbs up. Oh, great. Thank you, Nick, and thank you, Susan, both of you, for having me here for that wonderful introduction for this. <laughs> I walked in, I was like, oh, you're one of the tribe <laughs> of people who has a lot of plastic building up in your life. Um, just a, a little bit about literary arts. I have benefited both from um, fellowships and of course from the Oregon Book Award as a finalist and a winner and feel so grateful to have that institution here in Oregon to support writers. Um, the person who hosted the Oregon Book Awards this year made a joke because they t we, were we were introducing the winners, we winners from last year, and they told us to make sure we didn't take home the winner's checks this year. And he was like, writers must not make anything because they think they're going to steal each other's checks, <laughs> which of course is true. <laughs> we don't. <laughs> so having that kind of support um, matters so much. Those of you who are writers and artists know that. So um, it's just great to support them and yeah, definitely apply for their prizes. Um, I'll just read a few sections from this book. It's written in a bunch of short sections. 
And I'll read the, um, the beginning section, which gives a little bit of an overview of the project and then um, a couple more sections. I, um, a lot of times when I read, I bring along the plastic car part, which I still have, which is a very unlovely piece of plastic about this big. I didn't bring it with me on this trip. I kind of forgot it, but I walked over here from my hotel and I was looking for one of those because I have seen about half a dozen more in the like 15 years that I've had it. So <laughs> I didn't find one this time. Actually, it's very clean in this city. I didn't see very much plastic. It's a beautiful place. Okay. Um, the book has an epigraph from Rebecca Solnit um, that is, I wanted to trace the lost patterns that came before the world was broken and find the new ones we could make out of the shards. The thing turned up in a corner of the yard just outside the fence. I found it when I went out to take Quincy for a walk. Curved and black, plastic, four feet long, a foot at its widest. I thought at first it was a car bumper. I put it in the grass by the porch. The next morning it was still there. I sat next to it in the sun and looked closely. It was not the first piece of plastic junk I had sat staring at. For nearly a year, I'd been picking up all the plastic I found on my daily dog walk. I'd been arranging it into patterns, taking photographs. I'd been storing it all up in plastic garbage bags on the back porch. I didn't know exactly why I was doing this. I wanted to understand something. Plastic on the dog walk, plastic on visits to the beach, plastic studding the ground everywhere I looked. I gathered it all up. I am the no and the yes. A line from the poet Hannah Sobelman's first book. It has lived with me for years, sometimes whispering through my mind in its old remembered rhythm. In the poem, Sobelman follows the line with a qualifying phrase. She narrows it, makes it domestic. But I want the raw declaration hanging there on the turn of itself. I am the no and the yes. N Yay! That was amazing! <laughs> wow! <laughs> that was very serendipitous. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, for nearly half my life, I've worked for an environmental group. I spend most of my days in front of a computer screen, taking in a deluge of information about planetary trauma and emergency. Most of it floods through me, too vast to grasp. But plastic was a shard that stuck. Plastic I could touch, and it could touch me back. On this day, as I sat beside the car part, I was thinking about the German philosopher Martin Heidegger, his essay called The Thing. His book, Poetry, Language, Thought, had sat on my shelf unopened since graduate school. A few days earlier, on a whim, I picked it up. Heidegger writes that distance disappears and all things come equally close because of technology. In 1949, when he wrote the essay, he meant airplanes, the radio, TV. These inventions bring everything before us in image and sound. Ancient Egyptian pyramids, a cat in Japan, glaciers shearing off into Arctic waters. Everything flattens out, a uniform distanceless, as he calls it. But this does not make anything present. The only way to approach a thing, to bring it near, is by sidling up to it by thinking around or through what appears obvious. He performs this kind of meditation on the thingness of a clay jug. I thought of meditating on this car part. It had a smooth surface, shiny. One side was flecked with light splash marks from mud or paint. It formed a complicated shape, wide at one end and tapered at the other, with holes and slats and ridges all along its length. The widest end contained deep score marks, some scratched all the way through the plastic. It was stiff, but still pliant. Without the car body to hold its curved shape, it folded in half like a wing at its narrowest point. The image that came to me was an albatross carcass bursting with plastic. This was the first shard that stuck, a snippet in a news story about a piece of plastic from World War II found inside a dead albatross chick 60 years later. 
It stayed in my mind for years, like the no and the yes. I dragged the car part inside the house. Nearly 10 years later, it sits beside me near my desk. I learned this, that the world is not broken or that it has always been shards, kaleidoscopically interwoven, not one world, many threaded through one another like fungus hyphae through soil. Worlds end, as Catherine Yusoff points out, in a billion black Anthropocenes or none. Some worlds have ended over and over, lives consumed and discarded by individuals woven into systems that give them life and death power like settler colonialism, like capitalism. These are systems built by humans, but they exceed individuals. They extend across generations and geographies, planet-scale forces of destruction. Plastic waste stems from this consume and dispose violence. I learned that waste is not an unintended consequence of a miracle new technology. Waste is inherent in plastic production as it accelerated after World War II. In 1945, days before the U.S. military incinerated two cities with atomic bombs, a DuPont executive looked forward to the end of the war and the surge of buying that would follow as soldiers returned home and bought houses and cars, washing machines and refrigerators. The job ahead, he told a group of marketing experts, see to it that Americans are never satisfied. Plastic embodies this infinite desire. Conjured out of gas and oil, the seemingly endless reservoirs of dead plants and animals underlying Earth, plastic transmutes death into eternal life. The word plastic refers not to any specific object, just the quality of a material, that it is capable of taking shape, an endless stream of shapes. Objects formed from plastic ease suffering and save lives. Artificial hearts, IV bags, the tubes snaking out of a respirator. Plastic makes cars safer, airplanes lighter, and delivers drinking water. The single largest use of plastic, though, is for containing other objects. <laughs> I think there's a conductor. <laughs> Um, 40% goes into packaging to be used once and then discarded, driving endless demand for more. Companies work to keep these facts hidden. When the evidence becomes too overwhelming, plastic clogging roadsides, oceans, living bodies, companies shift responsibility onto individuals through things like anti-littering campaigns and ensure that taxpayers and municipalities pay the tab for managing the waste. The lives harmed at every step, human and non-human, drop out of the equation. The same consume and dispose violence threads through me also. It has benefited me my whole life. I grew up the daughter of a nuclear physicist in Los Alamos, the town that built the atomic bombs, which ended some lives in order to save others, perceived to have more value. We are woven into the same net, me, and bombs, and this car part. For a decade, I followed threads that tie us together through airplanes and sailors, the hydrogen bomb, Pacific Islands, the Nazis, and Heidegger. I followed threads through silence, loss, and grief, through the birth of chemistry and the invention of radar, through patriarchy, empire, and chattel slavery. I followed threads through apologies and their failure, through a pandemic and an uprising and living lungs struggling to breathe, through old wounds and new ones, hurt reverberating, aching to be remembered. This object, a book and its journeys, this broken down car part, it's life. This is my no. I've wanted this car part and its entanglements, often ugly ones and painful, to leave me. I've wanted not to have to face in my privilege the terms of its existence. I learned this. There is nowhere to go. The same terms that made this piece of plastic made me, my own body, and each of my breaths. This is also, it must be, 
my yes. So that's the intro. There are funny parts of this book. It's not completely depressing, I promise. <laughs> um, <clears throat> it has a lot of quests in it, and one of the quests was to figure out the origin of this piece of plastic that turned up inside an albatross chick that was from World War II. Has anybody seen photos by a person named Chris Jordan of plastic? Yeah, okay. It's plat so albatross chicks end up eating a bunch of plastic because their parents pick out flying fish eggs and squid from the ocean to feed them, but they also end up picking up plastic, microplastic, and feed, and it gets fed to their chicks, and then the chicks die because they get so full of plastic they can't eat anymore or drink. Um, and there are these very haunting photos of decaying albatross chicks with a core of plastic in the middle of the decaying body, and it's like, you will recognize your Coca-Cola cap, your cigarette lighter, a toy top, like it's sort of amazing. Um, what's in there. Um, but the very first of those photos um, was by a woman named Susan Middleton, whom I happen to know from my work. And so I contacted her and asked her about it and, the pl and did some research about the plastic piece from World War II. It came from a naval squadron that was piloted by a man named Elwin Chrisman, who's from Mount Angel, Oregon, just outside of Portland. So I contacted his son and got um, Chrisman's letters, wartime letters. He actually died um, at the end of the war, and his son never met him. Um, but I, I was able to get his letters, and so that led to this piece, which is called Garbage. Um, you know what? Hang on just a sec. I'm going to grab my water. <laughs> I just kind of processed that backdrop. <laughs> there are many recycling options in Portland, but I'm not sure that it's the best one. I also have a collection. Okay, garbage. The picture of the albatross carcass bursting with plastic appeared in National Geographic in October 2005. Beside it ran the photo Susan Middleton took of the pieces she extracted from the bird's stomach, more than 500, arranged on a white backdrop in an oval, like an egg, she said someone once told her. A few readers wrote to point out that a white shard in the lower right of the photo said VP 101, the name of Chrisman's World War II Navy Squadron. The magazine assigned a researcher to find out more. Louis Dorney, a naval historian, called the plastic piece typical of Navy ID tags attached to equipment, like a toolbox or a bomb site. Bomb site. The word fuses entities. Monsterish. As if the bomb itself had sight and could seek its own target. Or it gave the bomber power to see like a bomb. Which would be what? A falling, blurred, a blast, maybe light and flame, and then what? The bomb site, in fact, required the bomber to see the target with his own eyes. Then he could enter altitude, speed, and coordinates, and the machine would release the bomb at the right moment. It was supposed to give airplanes the power to destroy small things on the ground from very high in the air. It never worked well, so pilots had to dive close before dropping their eggs which is what Chrisman called them in a letter home to his family. Next week, we are going to drop some 100 and 500 pound eggs with TNT guts. How the egg of a bird is crystalline, made of layers lined with minuscule air canals so the chick inside can breathe. How the thickness of each egg's shell meets exactly the pressure each incubating bird will bring to bear. The plane that Chrisman flew to Jolo Island in the Philippines on December 27, 1941, carried three 500-pound eggs. So did each of five other planes. Dorney considers the disastrous bombing raid that followed the first most obvious incident that sent VP-101 equipment into the ocean. As he puts it, many men lost and mass confusion, lots of loose ends. Lots of loose ends.
I never saw the photo of the albatross chick in National Geographic. I first encountered the piece of plastic in a 2006 Los Angeles Times article by Kenneth Weiss, who devoted two sentences to it. It stayed in my brain, this relic from World War II, found inside a dead bird some 60 years later, this persistent little bit of death in life. It became a shard that stuck. But I ignored it. I was writing a book at that time about a cemetery. We were trying to have a baby. And I was sick, I had to finally admit. Sick from fear. Sick from fear and sick from grief at life in New York, a city with a funeral pyre at its core, in a nation thirsting for blood. I was sick from years, oh, this is amazing, they're like punctuations, it's so incredible. I've never had an experience quite like this before. <laughs> it feels very magical. Um, Back to being sick. <laughs> I was sick um, from years of trying to ignore the terror, which comes from the root word for tremble, that had lodged itself in my body the morning I sat on the subway below the World Trade Center. I felt the train shudder and heard a noise and wrote a thing that flies in my notebook, a thing that flies, that beautiful September morning. I stayed there and swayed in my life between the no and the yes. Mostly no. Mostly no was winning. I spent all my time in a cemetery. Then Jen and I moved cross country and agreed to give up the idea of a baby. As Claudia Rankin writes, rephrasing Cesar Viejo, any kind of knowledge can be a prescription against despair. I started to think about the plastic bit. I wanted to know more. I contacted Kenneth Weiss, the reporter. He directed me to Curtis Ebbesmeyer, an oceanographer. Ebbesmeyer sent me to Dorney. Lots of loose ends, said Dorney. Ebbesmeyer makes this guess. The piece of plastic got sucked into the Kuroshio current off the Philippines and spent 60-some years circling the North Pacific before an albatross plucked it out of the water, perhaps with nutritious flying fish eggs attached, to feed to its chick. It is the oldest piece of plastic from the ocean to which Ebbesmeyer has been able to assign a date. He and Dorney both presume it was made of Bakelite, but that is another loose bit. The piece of plastic has been lost. This is what Susan Middleton, the photographer, reported to me in an email. With regard to the bird's stomach contents, the last time I saw them was when I was carrying them around in a baggie and showing them in conjunction with presentations I did in Hawaiian schools in 2006. On Molokai, I realized I did not have the baggie. I contacted the school, but after a search, nothing turned up. It seems that perhaps the janitor disposed of the bag, assuming it was garbage. Garbage. The word once meant the waste parts of an animal. A thing that flies. I wrote the phrase in a notebook just before coming above ground to find the World Trade Center in flames, paper and debris cascading. I wrote it before I had any idea that the tremor on the subway train came from the impact of an airplane running into the building above me. I found the phrase again months later, looking through old notebooks for poetry material. I had forgotten completely I wrote it just before, the moment that can now be called just before. The notebook is gone now. I can't find it. It's not in any boxes of the journals I have kept since high school. Lots of loose ends. There is no way to know the true origin of the piece of plastic inside the albatross. The VP-101 squadron existed from 1940 to 1944. It lost planes off the Philippines, Indonesia, and Australia as the Japanese pushed the squadron south along with the rest of the Pacific fleet. The piece disappeared somewhere within a vast battlefield of water. Maybe Chrisman rubbed this bit of stamped plastic in his fingers as he sat waiting for his crew to fuel the plane and load the bombs. Maybe it hung from the life raft that burned so badly they couldn't use it. Or maybe it never had anything to do with Chrisman, his crew, or his airplane. The connection is, in that sense, false. I made it up. But how else to exist? How else but to weave our frayed ends together, to weave and reweave the net? How else to live, which means remain, continue? When we packed to move cross country, I decided to get rid of them, all the journals for 20 years. I put them outside, four boxes, by the trash on 23rd Street in Brooklyn. That night, it rained. I lay in bed and thought of them, the notebooks outside getting wet. 
I got up and carried them back. They moved in the truck cross country, but not that one from fall 2001. That one is gone. Maybe I threw it out in some kind of fugue state. I have always associated the word fugue with death, with funeral. Now I learn it means flight, the act of fleeing, a thing that flies, airplane or albatross, a person. The notebook has maybe disintegrated by now, or it sits entombed with rotted food, plastic takeout containers, clothing, and all the other objects discarded by the residents of New York City. And what about the albatross chick? Susan doesn't know what happened to its body after she took all the plastic out. It decayed, she imagines, in the hot, curé sun. What still exists, we know this, the plastic bits from inside the bird's body. Maybe they sit in the landfill on Molokai, or maybe they're back in the water, washed down a storm drain, or blown from a trash bin. The plastic will outlast the bones, the sand, this writing. Thank you. Thanks so much for being here. It was such a pleasure. Thanks so much, Allison. Yeah. Really lovely to hear you read from those from the opening chapter, and then that chapter about the like the remarkable piece found from uh, from an airplane, World War II airplane. Um, you know, I think what you read really um, conveys the breadth of what's in this book, and um, the op the opening. You know, your your prologue really shows just the ambition and what you, you hope to and do entangle in this book. And I, so I guess I'm wondering, you know, we might be able to call it rhizomatic. You mentioned kind of roots and um, following the, that, the web of connection. Um, but I, I guess I'm wondering um, some of the things you, you write about in it, just to, to add some more, is the, the development of nuclear bombs, um, the marginalization and erasure of women, environmental justice, of all kinds. It's very associative. Um, and uh, you mentioned in your opening that you spent a, a decade following, following these threads. So I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about the evolution of the book beyond if, if the fender really was that launching point. Um, you know, where did it take you next and how did you come to all these different things? Um, how did you give yourself permission to explore so much and, and find a way, a form through these short chapters that are in the book to hold it all together. That's a lot at once, I know. I give myself permission, first of all, over and over again, because I never have any idea what I'm doing. Can you, is it okay that I'm a little far? Um, and then I did remind myself that if I knew what I was doing, it would probably have been done already, so I try to comfort myself, but also I'm a poet. I went to an MFA program for poetry, and I, I like to joke that I have a license for poetry. <laughs> So I'm not a historian, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to do a comprehensive history. I called it an autobiography because the way I found to get my hands around this massive topic was just to try to investigate everywhere that plastic intersected my own life. And when I did that, these like kind of amazing things started opening up that just led me to new paths. So like Chrisman was from near me in Oregon and I could go see the farmstead where he grew up and speak with his son. And um, I always end up back at nuclear weapons in my writing because of coming from Los Alamos. And I was just happened to see in some research that plastic was the technology that made the hydrogen bomb possible. Um, it was uh, polyethylene, which was a new material in 1951 that no one was quite sure what to do with. And they lined the bomb with it and it made the fusion reaction work. Now it's the most common plastic on the planet. If you're almost any kind of plastic you're using for packaging is polyethylene. The car part is polyethylene. Um, so that, you know, opened up a whole thread that I followed into nuclear weapons. Um, and I also discovered that really, like, during World War II, you know, was kind of, they call it post-World War II, the, the great acceleration when technology really sped up. And 
the um, fossil fuels, plastic, nuclear technologies were kind of the three core of those, and computing. Um, that really took off, and they're all really related. Um, so it felt natural to link them. Um, I think you had more in your question, but. Uh, you, that, that is a great answer um, to a, a winding question. Um, I, I, you know, one of the things uh, I found myself thinking about is how you title the pieces, sort of extracting a key word for, for something that comes up in, in one of your short essays. And I'm, I guess I'm, I'm wondering, you know, how you decided to give a uh, title to your, to your chapters um, and how you decided to arrange them. The book, you know, it has some chronology to it, but it's, it's hyper-associative too. So were you, were you shuffling material around wildly or how, how, did, it, how did that go? The, so the, it is, for, if you don't, haven't seen it, it's, it's got like a ton of just maybe three to five page chapters that all have... I think almost all have a one-word title. That was just kind of intuitive. I was like, I need some way of structuring this book. And I had the idea that I wanted to make it like a braid, kind of. So you would read these threads <clears throat> and have no idea why you were reading about an albatross chick and then like a naval pilot and then like a World War II mathematician. And you would be super confused about why you were reading these things all juxtaposed and then it would unfold that they were all connected by plastic. My publisher was a little bit like, um, you might need to give a bit more of a map to your readers than that. Like, bewildering your readers completely at the beginning might not be the best move. So <laughs> I did write that introductory piece that I read actually kind of at the end to sort of give an overview of what the project was. But it does, it remains really associative and you know, the way I did it is that I wrote a book, as I mentioned, about um, a 19th century cemetery in Brooklyn, and I used, a, it's also really associative, and I used a similar method, which is styrofoam boards. Irony, I know. I am a plastic user like the rest of us. Some people, when they find out I wrote a book about plastic, are like, they hide their water bottles. <laughs> like, it's okay, <laughs> don't worry. Um, but I, I put these light styrofoam, like, insulation boards up and just, like, pin things to them, themes, actual pieces, and then I rearrange, move them around. I tried drawing maps, you know, I, I drew some maps. It was, it, was, it was also pretty associative, but once I was doing that without having any idea what I was doing, then the book kind of gets its own momentum going. And then you um, probably notice that the last third of the book is, has a different kind of, it, it actually is kind of a bit more of a linear, narrative momentum. It's when I start, um, I traveled through the Gulf Coast of the US where most of the country's plastic production happens and spoke with people living in communities that really bear the brunt of that pollution. And the book takes on more of a less like leisurely, academically, poetically investigative tone and kind of a more urgent, I think, um, mm -hmm. maybe a little more journalistic approach to, to what I was learning, so. Yeah, you know. yeah. Um. Yeah, I, it is notable. I, you know, one thing I talk about with my students is sometimes later in a, in, a, in a thing, whether an essay or book, it's nice to kind of mix up the form and shift gears. And, and your book does that in, in terms of being more on the ground and, and, and taking us on a journey through the American South and these heavily impacted areas. And I, I, uh, it leads me to another question I had, which is, um, you know, I guess at the outset, I didn't expect this book to be as journalistic as it is. You seem unafraid to strike up sub substantive conversations with people or co call people cold or reach out to people and, then sp and spend time with them. And I'm, I'm just wondering, um, you know, how that, how you became comfortable with doing that, whether you see yourself as a journalist or would define yourself as a kind of journalist. And this may also get into, uh, you know, how your, your work with the Environmental Defense Fund sort of prepares you or nurtures work like this. So that's maybe a two-part question, but can you talk more about how you get the confidence to be a poet and a journalist in the same Volume. Yeah, it's weird. I have, have journalistic instincts. I think my my initial desire as a writer was to be a journalist, mostly because I didn't know there were other kinds of living writers. I thought all poets were already dead when I, when I was in high school. Um, 
And so I think I have that kind of like investigative instinct. I'm also fairly introverted, so it is a cold plunge for me, for sure, to call people that I don't know. I think like the burn to find out is stronger than that, so I, I can take, take the leap, and I have found, I, I, I want to say 100% of the time, because I can't recall a time that was different, people always want to talk about themselves and their experiences and share about their lives. Like, they want to connect if you're willing to listen to them. And maybe being an introvert, too, is kind of like I'm more comfortable asking questions and answering them. I like to have people tell me, like, I was kind of interrogating you when I, <laughs> when I met you today. I was like, okay, then maybe not the time. But, um, <laughs> yeah, so it, it actually kind of just delights me, too, to make the thing that really, like, the topic is tough. Um, and sad, but I think the thing, and I write about this toward the end of the book, that really fuels me in doing it is, is the, um, are those connections, the connections with people. Yeah, and you, you emphasize, I mean, it's clear that you, you, you talk maybe in kind of a, a meta or process sense about the power of testimony and, and you worry over, um, uh, you know, whether you're uh, maybe participating in certain erasures or in inequities in the way you represent people, but certainly there's, there's so many small profiles of individuals both in the past and, and in, the, in the present in the book that the a community ethic shines through so strongly. Or could you say a little bit more about, you know, like some of the things that you felt were important in your representation of, of, of people as you profile them in miniature in the book? Yeah, um, so uh, the um, so the premise for the trip through the South is just to say this, is that I discovered that the carport I had came from a Honda Odyssey, the very first model made in the US, which was great for a poet, because it comes from the Odyssey. Mm -hmm. So I ended up with my family taking an Odyssey across the US to um, Lincoln, Alabama, where all the world's Honda Odysseys are made in what is billed to be a zero waste factory. And so our gambit was to try and return the plastic car part to them, which totally wasn't made. It was made in Japan in the 90s because that factory didn't exist yet. But, you know, it was kind of a way of just saying, like, this is a piece of garbage that, you know, will last forever. And obviously the factory did not accept responsibility for it because it's still in my house. But you have to read the book to know what happens. <laughs> Um, but along the way, we met with these communities. I had met with some of them before, um, almost all historically black um, or communities of color, low income. And the thing that I wanted to commit to is, oh, I have an exception. There are some people in those communities who did not want to talk to me. Right, and yeah. I document that um, because they were like, you white people come here all the time and want to know what you know and want to hear our pain but like what have you done for us um and so i you know i wanted to document that too that that was um, a thing that was happening um, for people who did want to talk to me i focused on not um parachuting in and hearing their pain documenting it and leaving i focused on um, developing relationships on long-term relationships so in particular this community um, called Freeport, Texas on the Gulf Coast, which is where Dow has the largest chemical plant in the Western Hemisphere. Um, I've continued with them, and their, their historically black community is basically now gone. It's being wiped out by the expanding industrial port there. And I was like, I have skills of writing and research, and what, what can I do? And they wanted um, oral histories. So we just have are finishing a series of oral histories of the community members. So I really, you know, it, I didn't, I wanted this to be about relationships. And I have a mentor from that community uh, who's become like a beloved friend and mentor to me and has given me way more than I've, I've given her. So that, that was one important ethic. That's, that's, that's great. I mean, it's, it's really, it is an odyssey. I hadn't thought of it. I feel embarrassed to say I hadn't conceived <laughs> of it as an odyssey, even though it's so prominent in the book. Um, uh, I, you know, maybe this is a good moment to ask about the synergy or and or tension between your your job as a in an activist, uh, a massive ac activist environmental organization, the Environmental Defense Fund, and and this this also activist but very um, literary um, production. You know, how do they feed each other? How do they get in the way of e of each other? 
Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I work for Environmental Defense Fund, which is a large, global, well-funded environmental organization that works on many big projects, mostly climate change, but not plastic, <laughs> not plastic pollution. So, and that's just because that's, you know, they've picked where they have strengths and expertise. Um, so in a way, it's sort of to the side of my work at Environmental Defense Fund. I, when I decided to write about plastic, I really wanted to write something about this huge shift that we're all in that some people call the Anthropocene, right, where humans are having a geologic scale impact on the planet, like shifting the climate, um, plastic pollution like everywhere. And I, it, it's interesting because I think that climate change has become more concrete now, but 10 years ago it felt like plastic was, was a concrete like daily intimate thing that I could write about that we could all kind of get our arms around. So. That's why I picked plastic. Oh, I wandered off your question. Um, I think my, I did not, I got a job in the environmental field by chance. Like I got my MFA and, and I spent three years doing that and then I was like, I need to get a job. Teaching doesn't pay very well. So if they don't know that, I've told them now, teaching doesn't pay that well. And I can type. So I got a job at this environment and I'd had some media experience. So I got a job at this environmental organization and that really has become my topic because I felt all this passion. I live a little bit in two worlds because that organization remains the sort of like very rational, lawyerly, policy, science focused organization without a lot of room for, I think to their detriment, to feeling and arts and emotion. So I kind of work to bring the two together, um, at least inside me, because that helps me thrive. But it, it, there is some tension there. Interesting. Yeah, I had, I, so they, they don't do a lot of storytelling. I mean, they do storytelling yeah. like marketing. I see, yeah. But it, <laughs> like emotions are messy, yeah. you know? Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so one last question, and then I will open it up to the audience. Is another notable thread in the book, and this was featured in your reading, is um, an exploration of etymology. Yeah. You're, you're constantly, in almost every chapter, I'd say, breaking down a word for us and mining it for interesting meaning and using it as a springboard to new, new discoveries. And this seems like, uh, on the one hand, a very uh, poet sensibility, right, to break things apart. And then there are interesting parallels with the content, um, the particle physics, the idea of like breaking stuff apart and what that, mm. what that produces. And maybe this is a gift rather than uh, damaging kind of particle physics on your part. But could you say more about that trend in the book and how it came about and what it, what it means to you. Yeah, you just made a connection I never made before between the etymology and particle physics, so thanks <laughs> for that gift. I think you're probably not the only one, so oh, it's in there. Yeah, yeah, it's in there. Um, it's in there for sure. Um, and it all, I mean, it, to me, it also, word etymologies are like digging under the earth to see what's going on behind this English language, which is such an interesting language because inside English, we have all these language from, lang or words from different cultures. There's a record of colonialism. There's a record of conquest. There's a record of really old conquest of the Britons by the Normans, right? And then later colonialism. So I love to trace that as, as part of all, everything that's packed into language. I also, secret, when I need inspiration, I look into etymologies because I find, and I use this free, like the Oxford English Dictionary is the authoritative etymology, but if you don't have it, it can be expensive to access. There's a free one online called Etym Online, E-T-Y-M Online, and it's a, like a lovely poetic and well-researched etymology dictionary. Some people are nodding, maybe you know it. Um, I kind of use it for inspiration as like a, an aid to writing. Awesome. It, it, it is sort of like a touchstone in the, in the book and it helps, helps the reader feel grounded in a, in a strange way, like chapter to chapter that you're going you're gonna to do that work. At least that's one predictable thing <laughs> in the book. <laughs> well, there, there are others, but it, it, does, it does stand out and it's really fruitful. Um, what, what questions do you all have? I have, I have more and I'm going to pass the mic so we can hear you and those online can hear you. Yeah, Jess. This is great. I can't read, wait to read the book. Oh, thank you. Um, so I was just thinking about like artistic impulse. Um, 
you know, and one of the reasons that people write or they say, whoever they are, I don't know that this is why I write or you write, but right, like this idea that you create something that will outlast you, right? Um, you know, Odo and Grishner, right? It's whatever. Um, and I'm just thinking about like, plastic obviously takes a really, really long time to break down. And especially the part about the losing the journal and that sort of impermanence. And I think, it, I mean, it's hard enough to write just period. But I wonder if that kind of juxtaposition of like permanence versus impermanence um, was something that you thought about. And yeah, I'm just imagining like trying to create this piece of art that will hopefully last a long time. Um, and thinking about the fact that, you know, God, like what if this milk carton <laughs> lasts longer, right? Oh, it definitely will. <laughs> Like, how did you deal with that as, a, as an artist? It most creator? definitely will. Um, I actually don't write, I don't think about writing, my writing to last. I want people to read it. Like, I love coming here and reading and sharing it and talking to all of you. But I write because that's how I want to be in the world. Like, it brings me such joy. Um, I don't want to I don't want to say that I'm not attached to the outcomes because like I I want my efforts to turn into something and to share them with people but I don't think about it long term in that way actually I don't I don't think about it lasting um and this this is like zombie material right like this is so wrong um so I wouldn't want it to last in that way. Um, it's so interesting about the materiality of writing now, right? Because it's not material, it's digital. And to think about what lasting means is that in that sense. I was in Ireland recently, and there's this thing called the Book of Kell that's like, some people are nodding, they know it's like, what, 1,200 years old, written on um, like vellum animal skin. Um, that's, a, that's old. Like that lasted a long time. I, I don't know. I don't know. There's so much now, so much information, so much writing. So, I, yeah, it all feels ephemeral to me in a way. Yeah. A quick follow-up question: You you uh, you spent a decade working on the on the book. What you know, if if you didn't think about it lasting, what's the advantage of a really kind of slow burn for a work of art in terms of what it can become? I think it really, I transformed over the 10 years that I wrote it, and that's one reason the book is different at the end. It was a nice generosity of you to say that's a good writing technique. It was like, a mis it was not a mistake, it was just the way that it unfolded. And some, actually, people that said it's a different book, don't put that in the book. Um, but it was so important to me to have it in there. Um, So I think, yeah, I was able to do some transforming. The reality of the slow burn is that a book like this that takes a lot of research with, you know, when I have a job, it just like takes a long, takes me a long time. I stopped writing it too because I get really depressed. I was like, I'm not having fun writing this anymore. You know, fun. I'm not feeling the passion of this anymore. And if I'm not feeling it, nobody's going to want to read that. So I actually stopped and wrote some, I wrote a book of poetry in the middle. So, yeah. Thanks. Other questions? Yeah, that helps me uh, think of this question. But when you stopped to write that book of poetry, how much did the existing book project become infused in that book of poetry? I mean, that book, it's called After We All Died. And it's a real like environmental dirge. I also think it's funny. I still think I'm funny. Um, but it's, it's all, it was kind of like my, I feel terrible, you know, um, grief. It's sort of like my lament book. So it's all kind of of a piece in a way. Yeah. yeah. And I wrote that one really fast. I wrote that in like a year, which n has never happened to me before. I was just like, I had to get it out. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for being here. I'm yeah, thank really you. interested in this topic. Um, I have some students working on the theme of islands, and oh. one of our classmates was particularly interested in trash islands, and we've also been talking about the military exploitation of islands, and I'm wondering if your project overlaps with islands in any way. Very much, yes. There's a big section, well, 
I spend time in Hawaii, so one of the things I do is go to a place in Hawaii called um, Camillo Point, which is a plastic collection site. Um, I go there a few times. I also write a lot about the Marshall Islands, which is where the U.S. tested all of its largest nuclear bombs and is also collect now collect is the, it's triple whammy in the Marshall Islands. They're sinking. So literally the Marshallese are trying to figure out, are they going to lift their islands or leave? They're inundated with plastic from the garbage patch, and they're completely contaminated from U.S. nuclear testing. So it's a lot. So yes, for sure. Island, there's a, just a new book about islands, too. I'll have to remember what it is. You, you might know, but yeah. You, you, you has had, for a long time, uh, a substantial uh, population of Marshallese students here. And oh, okay. Reading this, I think this book would be uh, incredible education um, for, for all of us here at UU in terms of w where they're coming from. Um, I, yeah. I was you know, really surprised to see the Marshall Islands appear so prominently in the book. <laughs> like, why are we in the Marshall delighted. Islands? Yeah. yeah, but also the poet Kathy Jetnell Kishner, who's a Marshallese poet. Okay, you're nodding. Yeah, incredible. She just doesn't have too much time to write right now because she's trying to save the country. But I mean, as with a bunch of other people. But yeah. Other questions from the audience? Well, I think with that, maybe we'll 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 stop there. And yeah. Allison, thank you so much thank for you, for the reading and for answering thank our you. questions. And thanks to Literary Arts for yeah. sponsoring your, your visit and to all those involved in Arts Fest. It's been uh, a great day and I and, uh, can't wait to have you back here with Thank your you. next book. Thank you. Thanks so much for coming, everyone. That was lovely. Yeah. I kind of forgot there were people online. I hope 